Hello, I'm Mason Brooks, Managing Editor of Epigenie, and welcome to today's webinar presented by Dr. Paul Shields titled The Role of the Exposome in Epigenetics and Aging. Dr. Shields is a professor of geroscience at the University of Glasgow, and his research has focused on various aspects of the aging process and related diseases, more specifically the underlying mechanisms behind them, and that's what he'll be discussing with us today. Before I hand things over to Dr. Shields, I'd like to thank Actimoti for their support and sponsorship of this webinar. Actimotif is committed to enabling researchers who investigate epigenetics and gene regulation through the development of high-quality products and services, including chromatin IP kits and reagents, high-quality antibodies to histones and chromatin proteins, end-to-end -end services including ChIP-seq, RNA-seq, and RIME, and kits to analyze DNA damage, DNA methylation, and histone modifications. So please check out the Actimotif website when you've got a chance. One last note before we begin. We'll have a question and answer session after the presentation. With that business taken care of, I'll go ahead and hand things over to Dr. Shields. This webinar will discuss aging as a process. It will discuss interactions with the exposome and how epigenetics links the genome and the exposome. Furthermore, it will discuss factors influencing the epigenome of aging. Understanding aging is important. Today, 1 in 10 people in the world are over 60 years old, and by 2050, 1 in 5 will be over 60. These will outnumber children under 15 years of age. This is a concern globally because the increase in the aged within the global population will bring with it a burden of chronic morbidity. The cost alone of treating non-communicable diseases over the decades spanning 2010 to 2030 is expected to cost $47 trillion. In Europe, the economic impact of socio-economic inequalities in health is around 1,000 billion euros per year, or 9.5% of gross domestic product. That accounts for 15% of the costs of social security systems and around 20% of the costs of healthcare systems alone. One can see that by the time we reach our eighth decade of life, at least half of us will have three different chronic comorbidities. Scotland is the sick man of Europe and Glasgow is the sick man of Scotland. As the top right-hand graph shows, death rates in Scotland are higher than any other country in Europe with the exception of Albania. However, when viewed by local districts, most local districts in Scotland have death rates comparable with most of Europe. The picture, however, is skewed by the east end of the city. The east end of the city has the lowest life expectancy for a male at birth in the developed world, while 12 kilometres away in the district of Lindsay, there is the best life expectancy at birth, on average, for a man in the developed world. So the city within a small geographical radius exemplifies ageing at the extremes. This sharp difference in life expectancy is tied to a very steep socioeconomic gradient, where those at lower socioeconomic position see earlier onset of diseases of aging. At a lower socioeconomic position, biological clocks may tick faster due to psychological or social stress. Those under social or psychological stress often have biological clocks that tick faster this can lead to earlier onset of morbidities, and accelerated aging is therefore a feature of many diseases, including diabetes, cancer, cardiovascular disease, and renal disease. Renal disease alone can reduce life expectancy by around 25 years. Psychological stress alone can reduce it by up to 15 years. To understand what is going on, we must think of aging as a process that starts at birth and ends at death. It is active through the life course. It can be defined as an accumulation of deficits taking place in different individuals in different ways with a variety of rates for different organ systems. This is not a passive process. 
It is actively regulated by genetic pathways, and therefore understanding the molecular basis of aging is a necessary step for therapeutic manipulation of these pathways to combat age-related disorders such as chronic kidney disease. Crucially, such an understanding is essential for learning lessons about good health in old age. Aging has been hallmarked into features that are common across taxa, that is, common to flies, to yeast, to worms, to mice and to men. The hallmarks can be broken down into primary hallmarks comprising genomic instability, telomere attrition, epigenetic dysregulation and loss of proteostasis. These are coupled with antagonistic hallmarks such as dysregulated nutrient sensing, mitochondrial dysfunction and the accumulation of senescent cells. And finally, there are a number of integrative hallmarks, such as stem cell exhaustion or altered intercellular communication. All of these hallmarks are now targeted for therapeutic intervention. Understanding aging across the life course is important because it reflects an interplay between genetics and epigenetics and the environment or the exposome, where your lifestyle, your socioeconomic position, your psychology, your nutrition and your physical environment interact with your genome and epigenome, either independently, cumulatively or synergistically, to allow you to gain physiological capability or biological capital while you are young, and in turn they will act against you as you grow older, so that you will lose physiological capability and become less fit as you grow old. Geroscience seeks to translate findings on aging to improve those who are frail or have limited physiological functional capability and make them more physiologically fit. To do so though, one must understand how such factors interplay with your genome and epigenome at any given stage of the life course because what is good for you when you're old is not necessarily good for you when you are young. This is the concept of antagonistic pleiotropy. An example might be cellular senescence. You do not want senescent cells when you're young and trying to gain physical capability and biological capital to breed, but you do want them when you're older to prevent the onset and spread of cancers. Myself and colleagues have tried to exemplify aging across the life course by using the kidney as a model of aging whereby renal allografts provide a source of healthy tissue whose function can be tracked longitudinally, while failing kidneys with chronic kidney disease can be used to exemplify features of accelerated aging. The exposome, therefore, reflects how our socioeconomic position, nutrition, lifestyle and physical environment and our psychology changes across our life course and influences our health. More fundamentally, such interactions will influence the balance between homeostasis and allostasis, whereby homeostasis implies that an organ remains within a certain range of physiological parameters to maintain stable function. Allostasis implies that an organism constantly varies and adjusts physiological parameters to maintain stable function. Over time, with the burden of lifestyle and the wear and tear that accumulates, allostatic overload occurs and the cart tips and a disease zone of aging appears. Each disease is a separate modality but all these diseases share common underpinning features of aging. The hallmarks of aging are present along with genomic hypomethylation, NRF2 changes, line element activation, calciprotein particle toxicity or phosphate toxicity, and changes in the microbiome. One can also view this graphically, whereby when physiological homeostasis is maintained, you're in health. When the environment pushes against your homeostatic functions, you can see that allostasis occurs. And with allostatic overload, you see features of disease unless interventions occur. So all of the separate disease modalities within the disease home of aging are currently treated individually. This often results in a small improvement in health span. If, however, we 
co target common underlying components. Each of the diseases within the disease zone of aging are treated as individual modalities, resulting in a small improvement in health span. However, treating the common underlying components of the aging process may result in improvements in health span. Therefore, targeting central structures of the aging process may be of benefit. This may enable compression of the period of morbidity into the final weeks of months or life and therefore give us more years of healthy living. What this approach does not tell us, however, is the impact of preceding generations on our adult health. When our mothers were in our grandmother's womb, they were exposed to the same exposome drivers of aging in terms of socioeconomic position, lifestyle, uh, exposure to toxins, nutrition, differences in psychology and stress. And while your mother was in your grandmother's womb developing, you were part of an egg within her. Anything that has affected the epigenome of your mother as she develops will affect you. This is difficult to factor into conventional studies in humans because human lifespan is so long and we age gradually and in a complex fashion. In the city of Glasgow, two key studies have taken place comparing those at lower and higher socioeconomic position with an underlying hypothesis that differences in ageing processes may help explain differences in their health. These constitute the SOBID study, standing for Psychological, Sociological and Biological Determinants of Ill Health, and the Longitudinal study, called the MRC 2007 study, looking at health differences over 60 years. The findings from these studies show that those at lower socioeconomic position do indeed exhibit accelerated biological aging by a number of measures. Typically, they have shorter telomeres. They also see an association between diet and inflammatory status and biological age. Chronic inflammation at a low level is a typical feature of the disease home of aging and it is also part of, part of the inflammaging phenotype in normative aging. Those at lower socioeconomic position, the most deprived, have typically more inflammation, shorter telomeres, and have a poorer diet. The diet is imbalanced because it lacks sufficient levels of fruit and vegetable intake and is often associated with over-frequent consumption of red meat. An additional feature is that environments that are perceived as threatening or toxic are associated with features of a sedentary lifestyle such as adiposity and the sequelae of ill health associated with that and also simply accelerating the rate at which telomeres are shortened and at which biological age accrues. One surprising feature of the Glasgow cohort studies is that inter-individual variation of biological age only explains approximately 10% of the variation in the observed inflammation. Intuitively, the presence of more old or senescent cells will result in an increase in the inflammatory burden due to the senescence-associated secretory phenotype, which, by its own nature, is inflammatory. However, while this is observed in laboratory studies and in tightly controlled clinical studies, in the general population, this is not observed. Epigenetics constitutes inherited changes in phenotype or gene expression caused by mechanisms other than changes in the underlying DNA sequence. These can be inherited either inter or transgenerationally. They regulate changes in gene expression that do not involve alterations in the DNA base sequence. And therefore, the epigenetic landscape can link the genome to changes in the exposome. One can think of the genome as being like a musical score. 
and dependent upon the level of the skill of the person trying to play that score, the instrument they are playing it on, <clears throat> and the room that they are playing it in, then that score can sound very, very different. So epigenetics can provide context for the expression of individual or sets of genes. Epigenetic modifications can either be canonical or non-canonical, with the canonical forms being DNA methylation and histone modification. The non-canonical are reciprocal networks of non-coding RNAs that regulate gene expression in response to environmental cues. All of these are heritable and they can be differentially modulated across the life course. Epigenetic regulation of gene expression is needed for proper spatiotemporal and developmental regulation of the individual genes. The methylation is often gained in the womb where stress can affect how it itself is acquired, maintained and regulated. So psychosocial stressors, dietary stressors and lifestyle stressors such as smoking and alcohol can have profound effects on the epigenetics of a developing individual. This may affect their health span in later life. And indeed loss of methylation is associated with accelerating aging. This may contribute to Glasgow's health disparity. As the graphics to the right hand side show, even monozygotic twins, due to differences in their exposomes, show differences in epigenetic patterns of methylation and histone modification. And indeed, this is exemplified further in the picture of the agouti mouse. These are two sisters with the same genome, but different epigenetics. The phenotypes are radically different. This also affects when and where given diseases will appear over the life course. And when one examines monozygotic twins, one can see that this varies quite dramatically. When applied to Glasgow, those at lower socioeconomic position were observed to have lower DNA methylation content. This loss of genomic methylation correlated with increased biological aging and indeed is a reflection of accelerated biological aging where hypomethylation of the genome is a typical feature. Rectifying analysis for income, diet or lifestyle in adults did not correct this which implies that these differences were occurring earlier in life. Furthermore, there were associations observed between the level of methylation and biomarkers of ill health including inflammation. So how might nutrition affect how we age? Is it linked to the type, quantity or calibre of food we eat? It's been known from both preclinical studies of model organisms, basic organism studies and human experience that both intermittent fasting and prolonged fasting can improve health and can increase lifespan. However, in man, this may have adverse effects in frail individuals, those of low body mass index or with a morbidity such as diabetes. The central dogma here is that dietary restriction or caloric restriction is promoted by restriction of dietary carbohydrate and lipid intake. In recent years, this dogma has been challenged and it has been illustrated that restriction of protein calorific intake is responsible for dietary restriction effects. Protein restriction or essential amino acid restriction, principally of methionine and tryptophan, has been shown to extend longevity in model organisms. It is expected to improve human health span as well. The mechanistic basis for this appears to be through upregulation of the transsulfuration pathway and the generation of hydrogen sulfide. Hydrogen sulfide has the ability to stabilize proteins and reduce reactive oxygen species and mediated damage. Methionine is also important as it is a constituent 
of a lot of red meat. For example, animals with more methionine in their proteins live shorter lifespans, and indeed, animals that consume lots of red meat, so obligate carnivores such as felids, like lions, cheetahs, tigers, or leopards, all suffer the consequences of having a diet rich in methionine. Typically, these animals are hyperphosphatemic. They are prone to tumours, and all of them show extensive renal pathology associated with a heavy inflammatory burden. Another potential mechanistic basis of this comes from hyperphosphatemia. Uh, this is exemplified by looking at serum phosphate levels in mammals and how this correlates with longevity. And you can see from the top right-hand graph that this correlation is extremely strong. A mutant mouse, such as the clotho mouse, with high serum phosphate levels, only lives around 12 weeks, whereas centenary in humans will live 100 years and have much, much lower serum phosphate levels. Humans suffering from rare progeroid syndromes, such as Hutchison's Guilford's progeria, also have a reduced lifespan, and this correlates again strongly with higher levels of serum phosphate. If you go to that clotho mouse and you knock out the sodium phosphate transporter, the animal goes from living 12 weeks to a normal lifespan, as is illustrated in the lower graphic. However, if such animals are put on a high phosphate diet, their lifespan returns to 12 weeks. Extracellular phosphate exerts its cytotoxic effects by forming insoluble nanoparticles called calciprotein particles with calcium and fetuin A. And fetuin A is a circulating inhibitor of vascular calcification. If these are not removed from the circulation quickly enough, they can be endocytosed, the calcium released intracellularly, where it enables mitochondrial dysfunction with consequent adverse health effects. Looking at the Glasgow population, an analysis of serum phosphate levels show that the most deprived have higher levels of serum phosphate associated with dietary intake, principally consuming too much red meat. As a consequence, those that consume too much red meat have shorter telomeres and have poorer renal function. Indeed, renal function among the most deprived is equivalent to having mild to moderate chronic kidney disease. And this is a general population cohort, not a clinical cohort. Indeed, if you look at renal patients with end-stage renal disease in Glasgow or elsewhere, one can see that there is an association with biological ageing. This is also associated with inflammation and is typical of what is observed in felids, but this is a human population. And yet again, we see similar associations with the prevalence of colorectal cancer among Glaswegians. Replacing animal protein with plant protein in the diet has been shown to reduce all cause and cause specific mortality. Indeed, replacing red meat or processed meat with plant protein resulted in lower total cancer related and cardiovascular disease related mortality. This has been re emphasized more recently by a large epidemiological study showing that red meat consumption is associated with colorectal cancer prevalence in a UK based population. Eating red meat also results in the acquisition of carnitine, and carnitine is a substrate used by many gut microbes. These microbes are able to convert it to TMA. TMA is converted to TMAO in the liver, and both these substances are highly proatherogenic. Indeed, TMAO produced by the intestinal microbiota, has been shown to promote atherosclerosis. It results in adverse health after bariatric surgery. It strongly is related to renal function and predicts outcome in chronic kidney disease, and most recently has been linked to vascular dysfunction in rheumatoid arthritis. If one looks at the Glasgow population, where those at lower socioeconomic position exhibit telomere attrition, genomic hypomethylation, increased serum phosphate levels, inflammation, and in conjunction with an imbalanced diet, then one can see that the production of TMA and thence TMAO from choline sits within the same biochemistry 
as the production of betaine aldehyde and then betaine. Betaine is a major methyl donor acquired nutritionally that contributes to the maintenance of our epigenome. This fits with those at lower socioeconomic position having less methylation on their DNA. Interestingly, if one looks at the microbiota of individuals within Glasgow, one can see that those that eat a balanced diet containing lots of fruit and veg acquire phenolic acids, and these are converted by gut microbes to generate alkylcatechols. And alkylcatechols have the ability to activate NRF2. And NRF2 regulates the activity of over 300 stress defense genes that constitute more than 1% of our total genome. Interestingly, foods that have the capacity to do this have been lost from the Western diet. These principally comprise fermented and pickled foods. And this may explain why we have an inability to have a good health span with the Western diet without serious interventions. This also suggests that targeting NRF2 as a, a common aging associated mechanism underpinning the disease home of aging, either nutritionally, via exercise, or via replacement of aspects of our microbiome with live biotherapeutics may be beneficial for our health. And indeed, alkyl catechols which activate NRF2 comprise a number of chemicals that have been shown to have potent senolytic activity, and these include facetin and quercetin. These strategies are now being implemented clinically, both to treat chronic kidney disease, improve hepatic glucose production and glucose control in type 2 diabetes, and indeed through the use of senolytics to improve physical function and increase lifespan in old age. Bears and other hibernating animals also give us more information about how we may improve our epigenome through modulation of our exposome. Bears, before they hibernate, will be eating up to 250,000 berries a day. Yes, 250,000. These berries contain large quantities of polyphenols called anthocyanins and also con uh, contain chromatin modifiers such as resveratrol that act on the sirtuin family. Anthocyanins principally give bright colours to a lot of plants and berries. Interestingly, anthocyanins modulate the microbiome in burrs prior to hibernation. And if one transplants burr microbiota from summer and winter to germ-free mice, many features associated with a given season are conferred on the mouse. One can see this in the accompanying picture where the summer microbiome and burrs that have been feeding on extensive quantities of berries has been given to one mouse that has become increasingly fat to enable it, if it were a burr, to hibernate and get through winter. Clinically, boysenberry polyphenols have been shown to inhibit endothelial dysfunction Blueberries have been shown to decrease cardiovascular risk factors in obese men and women with metabolic syndrome. High anthocyanin intake has been associated with reduced risk of myocardial infarction in women. And bilberries have been shown to have anthocyanins with anti-cancer effects. This is very promising in terms of simple, naturally acquired clinical interventions. Hippocrates, quite a few thousand years ago, said that all diseases begin in the gut. And this has resonance today. Humans are omnivores. They have evolved from frugivorous primate ancestors. Our guts and our dentition still look frugivorous, but many humans believe they are carnivores and eat far too much red meat. As a consequence, they suffer ill health. Interestingly, taking primates into captivity humanizes their microbiome and again this emphasizes how our exposome interacting through our microbiome and then our epigenome can impact upon our age-related health. One can see here that both Duke and Howler monkeys brought in from the wild rapidly change their microbiome. 
This happens within two days of being in captivity. This is a much underappreciated and not well understood aspect of our health. An understanding of how the exposome affects the epigenome and how the epigenome of aging is implicated in tissue resilience offers a means to translating some of this knowledge in a practical manner. The kidney can be used as a model for tracking normative aging and processes which affect this. Renal transplants, that is a kidney or renal allograft that is transplanted, is essentially healthy tissue. An analysis of the kidney tissue before and after transplantation and then again six months, one year or up to five years later allows a cross comparison of a range of markers that may influence physiological function and provide an indication of the level of physiological function at a later date that can be compared with chronological age. Such markers can then be used as a better determinant of how the kidney will function than chronological age alone. An analysis of several hundred markers, including those developed in preclinical models uh, in mice or in lower organisms, has indicated that the best such marker is the transcript CDKN2A. Its cognate protein is P16 Inc4A. This can provide a good determination of renal function post-transplant when actually measured pre-transplant. It therefore is a good biomarker for normative aging. When P16 Inc 4A is expressed in cells, the cells are in a state of growth arrest. They are senescent. The more senescent cells within an organ, the less function it will have. In head-to-head -head comparisons with telomere length, another biomarker of aging, it is proven superior. Flipping the coin, CDKN2A transcript levels can also be used to determine the progression of biological age in disease. Not only has CDKN2A expression been used to look at organs often considered marginal for use by surgeons, but also to track the progression of disease in a recipient that will eventually go on to need the kidney transplant. Notably, expression of the P16 Inc 4A protein derived from the CDKN2A transcript has been shown to be sensitive to agents within the exposome. These include environmental toxicants. Removing cells that express P16 Inc 4A, either via genetic means or via the use of senolytic agents, has been shown to improve both health span and lifespan in mice. One can then ask if CDK N2 A expression levels or P16 Inc 4A expression levels are reflective of allostatic load. The CDKN2A locus is complex. It shows the both developmental and spatiotemporal epigenetic regulation and regulation by both canonical and non-canonical features of the epigenome. Its expression also responds to paracrine factors linked to the senescence-associated secretory phenotype. In essence, it is sensitive to bystander effects. For example, a liver disease which will engender allostatic load can be used to spread that load throughout the body. The level of load can be measured through an increase in biological age via a simple determination of CDKN2A levels or P16 Inc 4A levels in blood cells. It is interplay between microRNAs and the exposome that allows alteration of 
cellular aging processes and cellular metabolism in response to environmental stresses. A blind screening of the microtranscriptome in human renal allografts, looking at the allograft pre and post transplant, has identified a handful of markers that are able to report on good or bad aspects of the normative aging process in those allografts. This includes whether or not the allograft will go on to show features of acute rejection, here listed as BPAR or biopsy proven acute rejection, when or when not the allograft will actually work, listed as DGF or delayed graft function, and the level at which the allograft will work at, that is how well it can actually filter. Uh, this is shown in the circle, which is labelled MDRD4. Many of these microRNAs regulate the CDKN2 locus, as well as the Sirtuin family, which are epigenetic regulators that modify chromatin. The expression levels of five of these markers can be used to determine whether or not an allograft will reject, even though it has been immunologically cross-matched. It will also provide a way of telling whether or not the allograft will go on to develop the leg graft function. Previously, surgeons have been unable to do this. Significantly, it can also determine differences between organs donated from those undergoing cardiac death or brain death. Some of the key biochemical pathways regulated by these microRNAs are involved in metabolic processes that determine inflammation, cell stress, cell survival, autophagy and protein synthesis across taxa, thus in flies, yeast, worms, mice and men. They are also uh, able to be altered and influenced by caloric restriction and by exercise. Hence, the microRNAs provide a good bridge between changes in the exposome, in particular the nutritional exposome, and the biology of aging. Use of the expression level of only two of these microRNAs and the expression level of CDKN2A can provide surgeons with a very useful clinical tool to determine whether or not an allograft or a kidney transplant that otherwise looks good to transplant using conventional clinical characteristics will go on to develop delayed graft function. Organs undergoing delayed graft function result in the recipients having to be dialyzed until the organ starts working. Such organs cannot be immunosuppressed until they start working, as the immunosuppressants are typically, typically nephrotoxic. However, with the simple test developed using two microRNAs and CDKN2A expression levels, one can see from the areas under the curve shown for estimated glomerular filtration rate, or EGFR, at 6 months or 12 months post-transplant, that the simple pre-transplant test shown in green is much more sensitive and specific than the conventional clinical test shown in blue. Additionally, different features of the organ can be similarly assessed <coughs> for DGF. And again, one can observe that the DGF can be predicted in 84% of cases with more than 90% specificity and greater than 60% sensitivity, thus allowing better patient management. This offers a way of providing a mechanistic basis for looking at allostatic overload or allostatic load and actual tissue resilience. Using paired biopsy samples from organs undergoing immediate graft function, as shown in the top graph, or delay graft function, as shown in the bottom graph, one can then 
cross compare the transcriptomes and microtranscriptomes. One can also look at methylation differences between the organs to try and determine what environmental factors are influencing the performance. This has been particularly successful in showing that irrespective of whether the organ works immediately or develops delayed graft function, that the transcriptional response between the two organs is broadly similar. However, organs undergoing delayed graft function, or DGF, have 42 transcript identities that behave differently. Looking at which biochemical pathways these are operating within, one can see that they are interlinked by a common upstream regulator. This upstream regulator is interferon gamma, which seems to be the master for the delayed graph function network, or as I have entitled it here, horrendogram. In essence, the cellular transcriptome in both these types of organ shows changes in response to cellular damage that is influenced by inter-individual variation in biological age. The transcriptional response to reperfusion injury, that is plumbing a new organ into the recipient and allowing the blood supply of the recipient to flow through that organ, is similar for each type of organ irrespective of their IGF or DGF status. The DGF organs, however, are less resilient and have decreased functional capacity. There are two features of the transcriptome that indicate this is due to immune attack on less resilient organs, but also that it may be due in part to the generation of double-stranded RNAs corresponding to line elements or ancestral retroviruses. Line instability is a known feature of biological aging. This may be a feature of the increased allostatic load in DGF organs. Notably, such organs cannot restore transcriptional homeostasis as quickly as those undergoing IGF. As the plots on this slide show, Organs undergoing DGF show a change in transcriptional amplitude greater than those undergoing IGF. For individual genes, this can be one order of magnitude greater in organs developing DGF. If one looks at the plot at the top of this slide, this is equivalent to the concept of allostatic overload where transcriptional homeostasis in this instance is not being restored as quickly as an organ undergoing IGF. This is reflective of exposome differences of both types of organs. One can see that if you examine by whole genome bisulfite sequencing, the meth methylation profiles of the 42 transcript identities associated with delayed graft function, the DGF key genes show hypomethylation pre-perfusion, i.e. before they are plumbed into the new recipient, and they do not lose methylation post-perfusion. The same transcript identities do lose methylation post-perfusion when the organ undergoes IGF. If the hypothesis that this is reflective of allostatic overload is correct, then one might speculate that commonality would be observed with other manifestations of renal dysfunction. This can easily be tested by comparing this particular IGF-DGF transcriptomics and methylation data set to other renal data sets in the first instance, and tested again by comparing to data sets from studies on ageing. At yes. least 23 of the 42 transcripts observed in the DGF study are common to other indications of renal dysfunction in keeping with this signature being indicative of allostatic overload. So what does this tell us about resilience? 
If one looks at the source of the organ undergoing delay graft function, and whether it comes from a deceased cardiac or a deceased brain dead donor, then one can assess differences between these two organ types. Notably, organs from DCD or deceased cardiac donors are more prone to developing delayed graft function than those from deceased brain dead donors. However, their long term performing characteristics are equivalent. In a recent large retrospective study of over 6,000 deceased kidney transplants and almost 600 transplants performed at the Leiden University Medical Centre in the Netherlands, data has confirmed that there is no impact of delayed graft function on 10 year graft survival in DCD grafts compared to DBD grafts. But there is a differential impact of donor specific resilience pathways, again mediated by interferon gamma and also by heat shock proteins. This tells us yet again, as with the original DGF study, that the exposome is critical and that allostatic overload due to exposome differences may be mediated by interferon gamma networks, that is interferon gamma regulatory networks, modulating resilience responses and potentially re repressing line elements in the genome. In total, these data are consistent with a model whereby allostasis impacts on age-related physiological function. Biological aging is accelerated by allostasis. And as our data have shown, one can determine a signature for a lack of physiological resilience that is common with other manifestations of renal dysfunction in particular and with aging processes. Physiological function is influenced by the exposome and in particular the nutritional and psychosocial aspects of the exposome are important. It operates at both a macro or organismal and micro cellular level. The effects are mediated by the epigenome. Therefore, our data indicate that these are amenable to simple interventions. And I have illustrated this by the use of nutritional changes or lifestyle changes. The nutritional changes are interesting in that they may be synergistic with senolytic therapies. Many senolytic agents are derived from naturally occurring food sources such as fisetin or quercetin. This offers up good hope for the future of improving health span through simple changes, adjusting our health to suit our exposomes or as a reflection of our exposome changes over the life course. Thanks, uh, Professor Shields, for that really great talk. Um, I'll now open this up to a Q&A session, so please submit any questions you might have in the chat box. Um, that way we're not all talking over each other. Um, if, you happen, if we happen to run long and, and we aren't able to get to your questions, don't worry. Um, I'll make sure to pass them along to Dr. Shields um, and or Actin Motif uh, for follow-up later. Um, or you can email me, mason, at epigeni.com, and I'll make sure to get them to the right person. Uh, there's already been a few that have gotten posed, so we'll just get right down to it. Um, Paul, if you're ready. Okay. So the first one is, um, how quickly does the epigenetic profile change well, when lifestyle changes? So, for instance, poor diet, increased alcohol use, um, enough so that it could lead to a disease. So it really depends which feature of the epigenetic landscape that you look at. So the microRNA changes, which are non-canonical aspects of this, can change rather rapidly. They can change within days to weeks. But if you want to make changes to the methylome that will impact on overall health, then they take a lot longer. They tend to be more chronic in nature. Um, and it also depends on which stage of your life course that the changes are occurring. So if this was happening while you were in your mom's womb, then if your mom was you know, taking far too much alcohol and you could have 
um, fetal alcohol syndrome, then that would occur over a number of you know, months during gestation. If, however, you were an adult and you were uh, abusing yourself by drinking too much alcohol, this probably takes more in, in sort of years to decades. But small nutritional changes that can improve health or improve your physiological resilience can probably be done in less than a year. And I think if you look at the current approach um, published recently by Steve Horvath and colleagues showing that an exercise regime, taking metformin and um, a, a number of other agents such as uh, growth hormone can reverse methylation changes in under a year. So there, there's a lot of hope in this. <clears throat> That's a little. That's a little. I thought uh, maybe we were doomed after once we once we direct our bodies. Yeah, I think there is a good body of evidence starting to emerge that we can change our trajectory of aging. So normally, I think the consensus is that we have enough fuel in the tank to take us out maximally to about 125 years of lifespan, but we never reach that because of our different exposure and our lifestyle. Um, the longest living human that's been documented was Jeanne Calmo, who lived in France. Uh, she made it out to 122 years and six months. As a, a young girl, she met the artist Vince Van Ock, uh, yet in her latter years, she was able to use the internet. So her lifespan crossed the barriers of the 19th and 20th century. Uh, quite dramatic, the difference that she observed over the course of time. Um, but for most of us, we'll not get that far. However, our understanding of our health span now and factors that diminish it has improved significantly so that we now realize, for example, that the microbiome in our gut acts like a surrogate organ and that it impacts on our epigenome, it impacts on our overall health. And modulating that microbiome can be achieved nutritionally, and it can be achieved by live biotherapeutic trans transplants. And that's something that hadn't been considered 30 or 40 years ago. Um, so it's not gonna make us live any longer, but it may allow us to live healthier lives for longer so that we can press morbidity into weeks or months rather than having to spend the last 10 or 15 years of our lives with ill health carrying a range of comorbidities and you know given another five to ten years the approaches now that are being used to modify our methylome may again impact on that i don't think we're ever going to turn back the clock without actually replacing tissue but we can um, <coughs> enhance our physiological resilience in the latter years of our life Great. Well, that is, that is hopeful. Um, so another question I have is how or why do, does psychological stress affect the epigenome? Well, that's a very good question. So our understanding of that is still rather limited. Um, a lot of this has been derived from original work by Bruce McEwen, who works on the hyperthalmic pituitary adrenal axis. And this really indicates that the level of cortisol in your body, which drives flight or fright responses, or fight, sorry, responses, is key to how you physiologically respond to stress. Now, the breakdown products of neurotransmitters often generate lots of reactive oxygen species, and therefore they can impact uh, on the integrity of our DNA in key cells at key times in our life. And they have a, that their production via that system can have a, a drip, drip, drip effect across your life course. So the more stress events you have, the more damage you accrue. So it's literally a, a reflection of the burden of lifestyle and the burden of wear and tear um, that comes. And that can be part of it. It also impacts upon how our, stress defenses function over time and it impacts on our inflammatory processes 
and it also impacts on our microbiomes in our gut because that does change with stress and it also is influenced by how robust our own immune system is so there are multiple layers to this and we're only sort of peeling away at those at the moment so there's no definitive answer to that but it's probably multiple factors feeding in does that make sense yeah thanks paul um so let's see next question would be um I guess this is sort of related, is is the allostatic load embedded within the epigenome? Ooh, okay, so that's a good question. It is definitely reflected in it. And I think it can be embedded in the epigenome if, for example, it is influenced by what is happening in the womb or what has happened when your mom was in your grandmother's womb. So you have these intergenerational and transgenerational epigenetic effects and one can observe this in the health of individuals whose grandmothers or mothers were exposed for example in the Dutch hunger winter um, during the second world war and the health outcomes often reflect when the mother was starved for example um, and whether it was in the first trimester of pregnancy or in the third trimester of pregnancy, so that the offspring and the grandchildren um, of that individual, for example, if it was the first trimester, then they tend to have metabolic effects and are more prevalent in metabolic syndrome in later life. Um, whereas those that were exposed during the third trimester tend to have uh, psychological and neurodegenerative problems. So the part of that there will be a, a what what you might call a preconditioning to stress so that they've come out expecting adverse conditions and have perhaps responded differently to um, the exposomes throughout their life course. So I don't know if embedding is the, the correct word for that, because if you expect there will be some priming of your genome to respond to rapid changes and in, in the expose on what's going to meet, then, you know, it will certainly be, I would say, reflective of it's probably a better term. Thank you. Um, so I guess the next question would be, um, you mentioned that hypomethylation is correlated with uh, aging. Um, just a, a set of genes or genomic regions that are that are impacted there that are more critical, or is it is it truly just genome wide hypomethylation involved? So that's a really interesting area of ongoing research for many groups, and it's a very exciting area. Um, so we we know that telomeric regions certainly lose methylation with age, but that also may be reflective of telomere attrition. And we have seen from our studies on allostatic load in the kidney that genes involved in the interferon gamma regulatory networks are losing methylation with, you know, coincident with a loss of resilience. However, you know, what we're observing is that the loss of methylation potentially at line elements and derepression of those elements so that you have, you know, retrosposons with the ability to either pop out of the genome or activate or transactivate. Uh, other such elements that pop in and out of the genome that may be really important. And very recently, there's been two outstanding papers coming from the Gorbanova lab and uh, the Johnson Evey lab at Brown, who's been working on this for a long time, um, showing again that at least in Murai models, it's uh, interferon type one responses and the repression of line elements are interlinked. Also, that regulatory network may have an impact on um, batteries of genes regulated by NRF2. So again, there is interplay between NRF2 and interferon gamma, for example. So it's difficult to say whether or not there are critically key sets of genes are involved, but I think the repression of line elements looks a very hot area through loss of methylation, of course. 
byproduct of environmental changes uh, that lead to a disease phenotype? So I, I think that's probably a combination of both. For example, with inflammaging, inflammation will prevent methylases working quite so well and therefore maintenance of your methylome may be impacted. So it's a, a secondary feature or an indirect feature of that. If something is happening, happening developmentally, then you might expect a direct impact on your health span and when and where in your life course you will get a disease. And that's probably typically exemplified by differences in the health spans of monozygotic twins um, and you know there can be a 20 year difference or greater and when they develop for example type 2 diabetes or even if they are genetically predisposed to getting breast cancer with a, a BRCA mutation when and where that develops in you know each twin is you know much as 15 years apart so the exposure was a big influence here Great. Um, so, so now, Paul, I'm mindful of your time. Um, do you want to take a couple more, or I'll take another question if you don't mind, given that we had to delay at the start. And thanks everyone yeah. for patience with yeah. that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, uh, one last one. Um, can you define normal aging, um, and then how does that contrast with the accelerated aging uh, that you were describing in your in your talk? That's a really great question. Um, so I don't think there's any gold standard or good description of a normative aging, but I think accelerated aging is certainly when you have this um, shortening of, of a, a lifespan that is reflected in a, a range of changes in both the hallmarks of aging, but more importantly, in physiological capability. So for example, take the kidney, and your kidney function will decrease over time. So that if you're filtering at 100 units per minute and you're age 30, that's wonderful. By the time you're 70, you'll be filtering around 60 units per minute. But if you appear at age 40, filtering at 60 units a minute, you will have impaired physiological function. And that impaired physiological function will often reflect chronic differences in your physiology that will be reflected in shorter telomeres, more inflammation, you will find SABD-GAL appearing in tissues, and you will see changes in the methylome and in features of the epigenetic landscape, such as regulatory networks that are reciprocally controlled through interactions between um, microRNAs regulating the CDK and 2 locus and chromatin modifiers such as sirtuins. So there is no, as I said, no gold standard for normative aging other than you should maintain physical capability into the latter decades of your life. The number of decades of life have been described for generations as three score years and 10. Um, and for many parts of the world that still holds, but in reality, we should be able to get that out to perhaps 10 score years and 10 more regularly. I think we are in that way with improvements in our medicine. Um, but it is, it is a loss of physiological capability, I would say below the age of 70 that really is reflective of accelerated aging. And that occurs with the manifestation of a non-communicable disease. And the type of disease you get and when and where in your life course, you get that, of course, will reflect this interplay between your genome and epigenome and your exposome. So if you're not dying from an infection and you are going to get a non-communicative disease, that non-communicative disease will have a feature of accelerated aging embedded with it. Well, thank you very much for your, for your time, Dr. Shields. And um, I'd like to thank you again for a really insightful webinar and, uh, and a lively discussion there. I'd like to also thank our sponsor, Actin Motif. And we appreciate that everyone took the time to attend and listen in. Uh, I apologize for the technical difficulties uh, to begin with, uh, but I hope that you've really enjoyed this webinar. Uh, recording this session will be published in the video section 
of the epigeny website uh, there you can also view other webinars and interviews uh, with our thought leaders in epigenetic research and goodbye from everybody everybody here at epigeny okay. thank you everyone